Ladies and gentlemen, the great Shaded Rob has returned. Somewhat. That said, we were supposed to actually play Dragon Ball Z Kakarot when it first came out, but QC got sick and we were waiting for him to recover. Honestly, I don't think we've actually recorded anything since, like, November, but I digress. I didn't want to miss the, uh, hype for Dragon Ball Z Kakarot, even though we did. So I thought I would just do a quick review on the game before the guys and I actually get around to recording it together for an episode. So yeah, let's hop right into it. Oh, and for the record, don't expect me to do things like this alone too often. The guys will probably be on my case for this alone. Chala, hey chala. Nani ga okite moki wa. Heno heno ka. Oh, oh. That, that, that ain't right. Nope. Be prepared for spoilers as they are coming up. If you're not down, don't stick around. But please, like the video anyway. Our channel is lame and we can use all the likes and subs we can get. <laughs> but yeah, Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. Admittedly, when I first heard about the game, I wasn't sure what to expect. I remember trailers about an alleged Dragon Ball project in the works and I said, Okay, or more accurately, can I pre-order now? No, no, no. But that's because I'm a huge Dragon Ball fan. I've been watching the series since I was but a wee lad in the 90s, trying to figure out the hard way people could fly like Krillin or not. Upon hearing that the game wouldn't be a fighter, I was actually curious to see what direction they were going to take. Could the player expect some grandiose tale? An epic series of sagas? A freaking sweet RPG? I don't know, but I saw the graphics were similar to the Naruto Storm series and instantly knew I would be on board. Eventually the game was released, my pre-ordered content was ready to go, and I was ready to embark on a mystical adventure. Then like 23 minutes passed. Dragon Ball Z Kakarot is boring. It's repetitive, mildly grindy, somewhat lazy, kinda glitchy, and unfortunately not fun. I remember what happened with the Star Wars rant Ray Chris Cosby and I did back in December. I'll try to put some order to this. In addition, I don't want to feel like I'm preaching to anyone, so I'll be brief. After all, I'm only giving my opinion on a few things I've picked up after playing the game for roughly three days. I could have gone much further, but I wanted to save some surprises for when I recorded with the guys. Anyway, how does it look? First and foremost, this game looks phenomenal, but that comes as no surprise seeing how it was developed by CyberConnect 2. I previously mentioned being a huge fan of the Naruto Storm series, and will go on to admit believing that they are some of the most beautiful games I've ever seen. And for the most part, the game's graphics don't disappoint. From Mount Powell's to West City, this game looks beautiful. I purchased the game hoping to become immersed in the world of Dragon Ball, and I'm not going to lie, I feel it. You can ride the flying Nimbus and do sweet loop-to-loops just like in the opening we all know and love. The cutscenes can be charming, frightening, and or intense just like the manga we followed for years. Heck, they even put in a little bit of extra effort to show us something new here and there. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to gather from this though. Whose idea was this? Did Goku do this as an adult and I forgot? This just looks wrong. Oh, sorry. Unfortunately, there's a few rough patches that could definitely benefit from a patch or two. I already covered the mysterious case of the extra Goku, but check this out. Some of the boulders aren't properly positioned. Then you get the infamous going through the floor bit. Mm. I think I can handle this. You like that? I let this happen for like 15 minutes. It was pretty freaking sweet. <laughs> One of my biggest visual issues with the game is the NPCs. And I'm not talking about Shen and Tao, although I could. I mean, look at these heights. That can't be right. Shen's a good deal shorter than Tao, right? I mean, the models might look okay if Shen were more hunched like Roshi, but he's not quite as known for that. I guess it's just a weird look you get when you make a character's head larger for the cartoon aspect. And that totally works, it just doesn't look as cool here for some reason. But eh, I'm getting sidetracked again, my apologies. Anyway, the NPCs in this game are not very fun to look at. Or maybe they are. I mean, I'm happy to see the game hasn't forgotten about the generic Tiger Men or Hippo Bros, but there's something about them that just strikes me as unpolished or perhaps simply unfinished. There are so many good things to look at in this game, but these guys definitely take me out. I don't know. 
Watching the game progress, I came to realize how much I value interesting load screens. This game uses the same loading screens for the entire chapter that you're playing through, which is kind of a drag, but whatever. How's the game feel? Honestly, I'm not sure. Let's start with the combat. When you begin the game, you're greeted by this big silly board of commands. There's both a lot I could say and not a lot at all. If you're wondering what the game plays like, I could say like Dragon Ball Xenoverse, but honestly, it's not even that complex. Maybe like the latest Shonen Jump Fighter or whatever that was called, I kind of forgot. While the gameplay is not exactly linear, you can think of it that way because the lack of skill required to actually control the characters. I spent a good amount of time trying to better myself against an army of these guys. Like, like a lot of these guys and a few odd Cybermen. Trying to pick up some skills or new methods of playing, but I couldn't really find anything which brought me to the realization that this is not exactly a skill-based game. That's not to say you can blindfold yourself and beat the first few levels, although I bet you can, but having played up to the fight with the Ginyu Squad, I have the feeling that this game doesn't really get harder. You don't need to be good to play this game well or effectively, which is something I feared for a long time. When I initially heard that this game would be a single-player and offline game, my shaded senses began undulating. There are thousands of reasons as to why people would play a video game online. One of the tops being to test your skill. When I heard that there was no online system for battling a buddy, nor a co-op feature, I grew worried there was no skill to test. While I have reason to believe that I am still reasonably early in the game, being well versed in the events of the Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z, GT, Super, and whatever movies or OVA you want to throw my way, I fear that the game will not get much more difficult. Ultimately meaning that this game isn't very challenging and probably won't have a lot of replayability. To test this theory, I began a complex series of studies that included playing the game for a bit, as the story attempted to progress, I began to realize my whims may have proved true. The enemy's respective AI doesn't seem to advance much from where I am. The only thing that keeps the computer mildly menacing is the actual level of the enemies you fight, which means that if you find a technique that worked at the beginning of the game, you honestly don't need to develop any techniques that may make you a better player in the long run. You need only to grind and constantly maintain the status quo. Which brings me to leveling. True to form, your Dragon Boys will get cut with experience. Dedicated training will not go to waste as you, much like a Saiyan, will come back stronger from each battle. Nah, I'm joking, you just get XP for winning, dude. But I'm honestly unsure if the grind is worth your time, because certain story arcs seem to improve your respective characters' levels to adequate points anyway. When I played, I slowly crawled over every last inch of the map in search of secrets. Naturally, so I could show off in front of the guys. Unfortunately, I mostly just came across a bunch of the same enemies over and over again. While it may have been tedious, I assumed I was becoming a big bad brawny boy. But then by the next chapter, they just kind of got boosted anyway. For a more challenging game, I suggest you stay low and avoid superfluous skirmishes with sky swimming scoundrels. But shaded, cries a young true believer. Surely the game gets harder. You simply haven't come across the later enemies. I'm not so sure, my friend, and don't call me Shirley. To foil my own win streak, I decided to attack these strange, red glowing, high level versions of the normal enemies of the game. I guess creating new enemies would have been too hard. The game clearly states that these guys are pretty beefy and boast magnificent power. They take it one step further by going Xenoverse on us and even describing these dudes as villainous. <laughs> After a little battle with those bruising bros, I found that my ideals still hold true. They weren't really fighting any harder, they just had huge life bars and hit like my college loans. Which seems to be true to the RPG element they're going for. There isn't much use of getting better at the game when just being a higher level will suffice. My final attempt at finding a challenge involved not actually playing the game, but instead passing the controller over to my father. While he can hold his own in most 2D fighters, he's not the best at dealing with toggle controls that require a lot of complex rotational movements and sexy little coordinated commands. He wasted the competition. From what I've seen, forget the movement mechanics, they're hardly necessary. All you really need to do is dash or mash the attack button until you're close enough to bludgeon your opponent to death, blocking only when a dude looks steamed. I'm not lying, they have a tell. See? This combat isn't very hard. 
But what about the free roam? Honestly, it's kind of tedious. As mentioned before, the environments are beautiful. Everything feels so appropriate. I can hardly describe it. I almost wish the game was VR so I could throw on my helmet, put an industrial strength fan in front of me and pretend to actually fly around. It's complete with caves, the beloved characters I know like Launch and Nam, and even the occasional sunken ship. And I'm not gonna lie, that's pretty freaking cool. To traverse through the environment, you'll find yourself running, jumping, or flying in some way, shape, or form. As expected, no problems there. However, you'll find that developers have littered their wonderful little world with a bunch of floating orbs. Yay? These orbs are a part of your character's leveling system, and it is imperative that you pick them up on your journey. The orbs seem to come in four major colors, if I remember correctly. It's been like two weeks since I played the game. Said orb colors are generally indicated by the terrain over which they are discovered. Red in the wasteland, blue in the sea, and all that. Upon collecting the orbs, you are permitted to spend them in order to upgrade your character with more powerful abilities and skills that will likely make the game more exciting. Unsurprisingly, the deeper you dive into the character's respective skill trees, the more expensive each skill will be. This ultimately made the game a bit grindier than I was expecting. Not that I mind, but if I wanted to grind for skills, I would have just kept playing Xenoverse. In addition, that means if you want your rock, paper, scissors attack to pack more punch, you must be prepared to put the adventure to the side, form whoever you happen to be playing with, and do a lot of swimming, high jumping, and going with the flow. Because the game definitely needed this part. You don't, you don't even have to control this. But don't worry, this is Dragon Ball, right? There's always something you can occupy your time with. The free roaming sections give you several optional quests between most story events. If you check your map, they're indicated by a cute little blue icon. These quests are often passive aggressively forced on your current character by a needy familiar face from the series. While most quests at the beginning often ask you to do some small odd jobs such as legit, I'm not kidding, go grocery shopping, others ask you to battle the same enemies that you just killed only moments ago. No, I'm serious, these guys are like polluting the sky, it's like an infestation or something. Then if you're lucky, they'll give you a little badge with their face on it so you can show them off to all the kids in school who aren't as cool as you. Jokes aside, these doohickers play an important role in your gaming experience as well. You see these guys? You want to know what these guys do? You don't want to know what these guys do. But I'll tell you anyway. These boards all give various benefits to the player. The buttons here can be placed anywhere on the board. The characters often find other characters attractive, and when that happens, you get spicy interactions like this. Take care not to succumb to evil, Piccolo. Never forget the wisdom of Guru. <laughs> I've had enough of you two. That's a little indication that those guys have sweet, sweet synergy and can do more combined than they ever could alone. That said, I advise that you take into consideration what characters have a natural affinity for and consider playing to their strengths. In addition, you should plan ahead and try to build a palette for maximum efficiency. That's a little judo wisdom for you there. Always keep maximum efficiency and mutual benefit in mind. That's just a useful mentality. Regardless, if you want a certain pair, but their strength doesn't exactly match where you want to put them, don't stress. Please don't let Dragon Ball Z Kakarot be the game that grays your hair. Throughout the game, without even noticing it, you'll be picking up various items and goodies that can be gifted to your character's pins and boost their level of expertise to varying degrees. Find what makes you comfortable and have fun. Oh, when the actual free roam controls are meh. Flying can sometimes prove annoying, taking off feels a little odd at first, but if you've played other Dragon Ball games, or not, you can handle this. It is kind of annoying that you have to completely land to talk to someone though, but I suppose I'm just nitpicking, right? How does this sound? Well, this category is a bit of a stretch, but I don't mind complaining. If anything, I like it. The actual sounds of this game are pretty freaking epic. Most of the game seems to be accompanied by recreations of the original Dragon Ball Z soundtrack. I may be a Bruce Falconer fan personally, but I won't lie. I find the Japanese sounds just as enjoyable. What better way to get the player in the spirit, you know? See, I've got nice things to say too. Now to watch it away though. 
The downside is the voiceovers. I haven't listened to the Japanese audio yet, but the English dub isn't too much fun. Don't get me wrong, it's no fault of the voice actors themselves. I love hearing Christopher R. Sabat yell at himself in a booth as much as the next guy. Unfortunately, they only use so many voice clips. The repeated monologues and lines in this game is borderline traumatizing. Check this out. Again, this is real. Couldn't they have made like six alternating versions of that or something? I don't really make video games, so it's not fair for me to judge the process too harshly, but that does sound lazy to you guys as well, right? In conclusion, okay, I'm getting tired, so I'll try to wrap it up here. I have a lot of conflicting opinions regarding Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. Most of the game looks fantastic, but that was never a surprise. There are so many things to do in this game, a lot of which I haven't even covered. But so many of these things aren't necessarily interesting. I can falcon punch a deer out of existence, have an illegal street race, or even gather a bunch of ingredients and have Chi Chi or some other chef fry up Gohan a stat boost. But they hardly feel germane to the Dragon Ball experience. The game doesn't feel like a Dragon Ball adventure as much as it feels like busy work. Gathering eggs and tomatoes for turtle isn't exactly riveting. In fact, there are too many elements of this game that aren't exactly fun. The game includes sections where you can shoot dinosaurs in the face for no reason. Sure, you get some dino meat afterwards, but then it's just back to Chi Chi. And I love Chi Chi! She's my favorite Dragon Ball gal! But this game is so repetitive! Everything about this game is. Outside of the boss battles, which are admittedly pretty freaking cool, the fights are all the same and don't require much skill. The orbs you pick up just respawn for an endless loop of flying around and killing time. What's even more upsetting is the inability to play as all of the Z-Warriors. I understand he's not the popular pick, but my favorite character is Yamcha. I find it lame that I can only play alongside him for a few select quests. Being a Yamcha fan is already hard enough as is what with all the memes and junk that's been flying around for the past few years, not to mention the amount of run he gets in this anime and manga. But he was in the latest chapter of Super, so fingers crossed for more Yamcha action. Anyway, you can only play as Goku, Gohan, Vegeta, Piccolo, Trunks, Gotenks, and Vegito. If you're a fan of the human characters, I'm afraid that's too bad. <sighs> I know I've been complaining a lot, but it's not like I really want to. I love the series and intend to finish the game. I mean, I spent $85 on it, you bet I will. It's just that the game is somewhat disappointing, which is weird to me. For like 30 years, we've been buying Dragon Ball games and loving it. Most, if not all of them, tell the same story in some way or another. Heck, that's why we buy them in the first place. We enjoy the story and willingly rewatch, listen, and play it over and over again. It's to the point where I'm wondering if it's my own personal desire for something that was never promised that's disappointing me. Maybe I'm looking for something in this game that simply isn't there. For a moment, I'd like to picture myself as a 6 to 11 year old overweight child. If I had received this game back then, I'd probably be over the moon with how much I could do in the game like this. I could fly around, wreck Saiba scrubs, and collect little doodads forever. Honestly, it sounds pretty sweet for a kid. I could easily see my younger self playing this game for months on end. And maybe that's why I shouldn't be judging this game so harshly. It's a game that if I take a look at it from a less judgmental perspective, has a lot to offer. If I want something more skill based, I could go play Fighters or Xenoverse. Perhaps I should stop trying to see this game how I want to see it and just look at it for what it is. Things just got interesting. Which is repetitive and boring. Jokes aside, the game has potential and I can see it becoming more intriguing the deeper I dive into the game. But that's already one of the issues I have with Kakarot. It's difficult to start anything, be it a movie, comic, TV series, or video game on the notion that it gets so much better later on. The game is kind of weak right out of the gate and that hurts a lot. You just can't shade those first impressions sometimes. Look at how long it took for us to actually appreciate Dragon Ball GT. But while I can see the kid in me playing this game for months, 
The adult in me is kind of done already and probably won't be enjoying a second playthrough of the story. So far I can only say that this game is between meh and I. Certainly isn't on my list of greats. But don't take my word for it, if you're a real Dragon Ball fan you should go and find out for yourself. I still love the lore and don't intend to quit supporting the series. If you made it this far, thanks for listening to me babble on for roughly, what, 20 minutes? Uh, this is Super Game and Chill, I'm Shaded Rob, and um, rest in peace Bryce Armstrong. Again, you won't be the same. Yeah!